again is Nathan. So Sarah, what are we drinking this week? Well, this week we are drinking fruit punch and ginger ale. And for those of you who drink alcohol, feel free to add any alcohol of your choosing. And this week is called The Cockship because we'll be talking about the life of Ignatius Cockship. Okay, Sarah, for those who aren't familiar, who exactly is Ignatius Kaksha? Well, uh, Ignatius Kaksha was born on August 24th of 1812 to James Kaksha and Mary Nightingale in Bradford, Yorkshire, England. He also had a sister named Jane, and Ignatius not only came from a manu manufacturing business family, but also coming from an up-and-coming manufacturing town. So it's kind of obvious what sort of field that Ignatius will eventually go into. Wait a minute, Sarah. Why are we in England? I thought we were talking about Brantford here. I'm getting there. Hold on. Anyway, in 1827, after disposing of that business that he had in Colm, James Cockshut made the decision to move himself and his family from their native country in England to York here in Canada, which is now known as Toronto. And upon reaching York, he opened up a general store east of an unknown market in a rented building. Okay, Sarah, how do things go after the first year in 1828? Well, uh, in 1828, James Cockshut and his friend James Laycock, who is the one that convinced him to change his plans and move to York instead of moving to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, opened a double store in a dwelling on King Street. And shortly afterwards, uh, Laycock sold his stock of goods to Cockshut. And this turned out to be a very prosperous business, and uh, Kaksha actually decided to open up a branch in Brantford. So we're now in Brantford? Yep, the Brantford project started in the fall of 1829 under the name Batty & Co. And Ignatius, who was 17 at the time, was sent there to assist in business. However, this business had a very short life, and after which Ignatius returned to Toronto to assist his father. Wow, 1829? That's pretty early. But we're done with Brantford already, Sarah? Well, actually, in 1832, it was decided to establish a branch in Brantford once again. However, this time, instead of coming as an assistant, Ignatius came here as manager. And this branch actually flourished to the point where it outgrew the home uh, Toronto plant, and his father didn't immediately admit to this. But this successfully launched uh, Ignatius's future business career. Wow, that's crazy he was able to build his Brantford business so quickly and make it so prosperous. So what was the rest of his business career like? Well, uh, due to Ignatius' knowledge of business from England, uh, it actually showed that he had very good executive abilities that are especially adapted to being in this new country. And eventually, the Bramford project grew to a point where it required much more time and attention than uh, just Ignatius could give. So eventually, the, tr the Toronto project was abandoned for uh, the Bramford project. That's crazy! Now, you said this was a business, but what exactly type of business was he running anyways? Well, uh, they had a great variety of things, such as baskets and straw works, wood, hay, grain, dairy products, as well as labor were all taken in exchange for merchandise. Wow, that's a lot of products he's offering. So did his business ever suffer at all? 
Well, uh, there was a recurring um, cycle of commercial depression, which brought down many traders. However, uh, the cockship business still continued to trek through the hard times and was able to continue maintaining and strengthening uh, credit even through the worst of times. Uh, no enterprise wanted to try and engage in expansion until there was a capital that was able to sustain it. So did James Cockshut own this business the entire time then? Well, actually, in 1840, uh, James Cockshut sold his business to his son, Ignatius, and his daughter, Jane, who continued the business under the name I.N.J. Cockshut. Okay, so then what happens to Jane in this whole business affair? Well, uh, eventually, six years later, in uh, 1846, she actually withdraws for the company, from the company, leaving her brother as the sole control and responsibility for the company, uh, which has now become much larger and much more of an important concern than it was before. But luckily, Ignatius was already well acquainted with the field at this point. Wow, he takes on more and more. Does this man have no limitations? He actually knew his limitations very well. He never overstepped them and he always made sure to not injure his body or his mind. Uh, and he also had resources on reserve just in case, as well as the um, Village store was a main part of his success. Okay, so his business is very successful and prosperous, but certainly he's doing other things in and around the community. Well, he was actually in Brantford for quite a long time. He actually watched Brantford go from a village to a town and eventually a city. He was also on the board of directors for Buffalo, Godrich, and Lake Huron Railroad, which was the first railroad that ran through Brantford, which was constructed between 1850 to 1854, and this railroad wasn't very profitable when it first started. Okay, so railroads are just one part of his many business ventures. What else is he doing with his businesses? Well, he and several others came to the aid of Brantford Gas Company when it was in imminent danger of collapse in 1854. Uh, said company was reorganized with additional funds, and not only that, but Ignatius kept this presidency up until his death. Okay, Sarah, I heard Brantford had a lot of fires in its early days, and the downtown almost burned down. So this must have threatened his business prospects. What did he do to address that? Well, uh, because of all the fires due to silly competitions between the volunteer firefighters, uh, Ignatius actually decided to promote Brantford's Waterworks Company, uh, to which he was also the president of said company. And this would provide uh, fire protections and because of this, the fires actually ceased. Wow, that's a lot of businesses he's operating. Certainly there's more. Uh, yeah, there actually is. He was president of the Craven Cotton Company in the very short time that it was running. And he was also the co-president of Coxshut Plow Co Company which was founded by his son James, not to be confused with his father James. Uh, however, soon after this, his son was actually disabled due to disease, which actually caused his unfortunate death. And this company did struggle. However, Ignatius kept this business up and retained his position up until his death. Okay, Sarah, you mentioned about his son, so what about his wife? 
In September of 1846, Ignatius actually married Margaret Gemmell. However, this marriage was very short because in the following August, she died due to a fever, leaving an infant daughter named Mary, not to be confused with Ignatius's mother, Mary. And uh, due to this, Ignatius actually threw himself into his work to cope with this. However, he did remarry in September of 1850 to Elizabeth Foster, the eldest daughter of Francis Foster. This marriage actually uh, lasted 42 years of uninterrupted happiness. In total, uh, he had nine kids who survived to adulthood and three who died in infancy. So then, what kind of personality did Ignatius Cockshut have? Well, he was the type of man that never yielded to influences in his environment. He was also very dependent upon by the community to, due to how much he was involved. It was also not uncommon for her, him to get into arguments either due to his short temper. So what did Ignatius do for the community then? Well, he built and funded a widow's home and orphanage on Sheridan Street. Uh, he also um, built a set of cottages for women whose husbands had often died early. Uh, he also owned so much land that they donated a lot of the land to start the city's park system. It was also the Cockshut family that donated the land for Cockshut Park, but uh, back then it was known as Agricultural Park and hosted fairs. So Ignatius sounds like quite the guy. What was the end part of his life like? Well, Ignatius actually enjoyed good health for the greater part of his life. However, in the years leading up to his final illness, the many people around him could tell that his health was steadily decreasing. Even so, he continued to attend all of his businesses and would drive himself to work each day, and also took long drives out to the countryside to check on the Brantford and Oakland Road that he remained, that remained in his care. Wait a minute, Sarah. What's this spinal sickness all about? Well, uh, his final sickness started in February of 1901, but uh, even having gotten a severe cold, that still didn't stop him from making his usual rounds. However, a few days after his sickness started, it still sh showed no signs of going away. Thus, uh, Dr. Digby was actually called in to evaluate Ignatius's illness. And it was obvious that Ignatius was nearing death's door. He told his, ascend his attendants to stop giving him the remedies for the cure to his illness. He also requested that members of his family that were living away from Brantford gather at his house and stay there till the end of his life. To which they did, which made him very pleased. Eventually, on March 1st, 1901, Ignatius Kaksha died at his home, and his funeral took place on March 4th. Wow, what a great story! And he certainly had a lot of influence in Brantford's early development. Indeed he did. Anyway, join us next week for another episode of Brant History Happy Hour.